The Justice Department reportedly weighing whether to charge at least one bank over growing interest rate fixing scandal. You may know bank giant Barclays has already paid nearly a half a billion dollars in fines for illegally manipulating the rates that banks charge each other to borrow money. That rate has a huge effect on the economy. Everything from credit cards to car loans, mortgage rates, it all factors in. So when banks mess with those rates, we potentially all pay the price. And it still remains to be seen whether the Treasury Secretary, Tim Geithner, knew about this bank manipulation, the rate manipulation in the first place, back when he was ahead of the New York Federal Reserve Bank. Judge Napolitano is in the house now to talk about all this. It's the LIBOR rate, and it's some kind of foreign to most people. I mean, it is. You don't really know that much about it, but You're, man, it's important. Well, it's extremely important. So think of it this way. The biggest banks in London each morning announce what they're going to charge each other for money, and that number is averaged. So LIBOR is just an acronym for uh, the, the names of these banks and the offering of it. Uh, London Interbank Offered Rate, well, whatever that rate is, is the baseline for millions of other loans and mortgages around the country. LIBOR plus two, you'll pay that baseline plus uh, another two percentage points. We now discover that some of the London banks, many of whom also do business in the United States, were intentionally, inaccurately reporting what those numbers were, so as to goose up this rate, so as to be paid a higher interest rate. Now that affects many, many banks and many people paying their loans, some of whom have nothing to do with the banks that concocted this. You may get a loan from the First National Bank of Oxford, Mississippi, and they may say, Shep, you're, you're a good risk, we're going to charge you LIBOR. Your rate went up because of these shenanigans in London, even though your bank in Oxford had nothing to do with it. Your bank overcharged you, in my hypothetical, and you overpaid. Now comes the government. The government decides to prosecute criminally, to sue civilly, and to administer, to, to regulate administratively. And they collect hundreds of millions in fees and fines from the banks. Question, where does that money go? To the government, not to the innocent lenders who overpaid because LIBOR was inaccurately calculated. Well, now I'd be very curious to know who knew what when, especially when the government is making money off this. And it sounds like a tax on us all. Well, what's, what's very serious, and you mentioned it a few moments ago at the, the end of the intro here, is the present Secretary of the Treasury, Timothy Geithner, was the president of the New York Federal Reserve at the time that this was going on. Did he know about it? Did he look the other way? Did the New York Federal Reserve have any, have any liability here? We'll see how deep the Obama Justice Department wants to dig as it investigates this one. Well, there, there's been a lot written already, and it sounds like, strangely, a lot of people knew this was going on. Shep, you're talking about millions of loans and trillions of dollars. This may very well be one of the largest instances of bank orchestrated fraud in the history of the world. Wow, the banks are committing fraud against the people. It's hard to imagine. Who would have heard of such I a thing? I never would have thought that possible. <laughs> we'll see where it goes. Thank you, Judge. You're welcome, Shep. Several California cities have found a creative way to fix their mortgage mess. They'll condemn your house, crashing its value, so you can get a new mortgage at a better rate. It sounds like a great deal, but is that legal? Here to weigh in right now, Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano. So they wouldn't condemn the house, would they? They'd condemn the mortgage. They would condemn the mortgage. This, this is very novel, and, and Eric would know more than I about whether this would work economically. Fine, we'll talk to him. But the, the, here, here's the legal issue. When the government is going to assert itself to help people, it has something called the Equal Protection Clause, meaning it has to treat all similarly situated people in a similar way. Stated differently, how would it decide who to bail out Solyndra, who to let die on the vine? Would it be a political decision? No. It has to be done equally for everybody in the same situation. The government simply doesn't have the money. In fact, this particular county, San Bernardino mm -hmm. County, the yeah. county seat, the city of San they Bernardino, file for filing for bankruptcy. Right. Right. So, look, they would would have to come up with enough cash to pay off the underlying loan, Eric, and then they'd have to find somebody else who's willing to lend that money, Wait. even though the value of the house is not going to go Who's up. Who's they? Who would have to come up with the money? 
the town, uh, the, the municipality is going to condemn the mortgage. When you condemn something, you pay the owner of it the fair market value of it. So they would have to come in. Let's say you had a house worth a hundred thousand right. dollars, but you had a hundred and twenty-five thousand dollar mortgage on right. it because the value of the house went down since you bought it. The municipality would have to come up with that hundred thousand to pay the bank. Where are they going to get that cash? And then after they do that, they have to get an investor to pay them the hundred thousand, and the investor then has the mortgage. Okay, so, so this, is just this a sounds plan? better. Than it is. It's just a plan. It yes. hasn't been enacted yet. Yes. Okay. Be because who? City council is going to vote on it. Who's going to vote on it? Yes. Do we know? The condemning authority, which is the city council. Well, well, in this case, it's the county of San Bernardino, which, by the way, is half the size of New Jersey. This is the largest mm -hmm. geographical county in the United States of America. Would have to come up with this kind of cash in this environment. I suggest to you that this is just a political well, suggestion to make the office holders sound okay. like they want to help people All right, out. there's that idea, but what about this? Since they're filing for bankruptcy, could all of this fall into the bankruptcy so all these mortgages could be forgiven? No. No, because the, the bankruptcy would have to be the individual bankruptcy of the, of the uh, owner, owner of the house. And the real estate would pay back the bank. It wouldn't go into the mortgage. So, uh, the so here's, in a, here's the, the little game they're playing here. The, tax, the uh, homeowner is going to be made whole. The bank who own, holds the lien is going to be made whole. The taxpayer in, in California, San Bernardino County, is the one who's going to have to come up with the money. But why do you do it? Why are they doing it? Here's what I suspect is why they're doing it. Is so many homes are going into default. They're trying to lower the value of the homes in the area so they can pay their property taxes. So... It makes it more difficult for them the, to go into That's default. a very good point constitutionally because that awful uh, eminent domain case, Kilo versus New London, mm -hmm. says the government can condemn property as long as it somehow benefits the government. So if the value of the house goes down, the value of the mortgage goes down, but the people are staying in and still paying real estate, real estate taxes, that benefits the government. I'm guessing, could be wrong, but I'm guessing that's the premise. Bottom line is they have to come up with a lot of cash, Eric. Yep. I don't think they can do it. <laughs> no kidding. Right, well, this is an interesting exercise then in futility. Is this, it was. It was. What can the government get away with? Whatever it wants. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> All right, Judge, thank you very much. Bless you, guys. Have a good See one. See you later. You okay. The banking giant, HSBC, is under fire on Capitol Hill today over allegations it's lax tax rules helped terrorists and Mexican drug cartels launder billions of dollars through U.S. operations. According to the Senate investigation, those groups and other criminals were able to funnel illegal profits through U.S. accounts to make it all look legit. In the process, they apparently got access to the country's financial system, and lawmakers say that poses a national security threat. Wrongdoers can use U.S. dollars and U.S. wire transfers to commit crimes, arm terror groups, produce and transport illegal drugs, loot government coffers, and even pursue weapons of mass destruction. The Senate report also indicates that Iran, North Korea, and other rogue regimes, as they call them, use the bank to get around U.S. financial restrictions and that government regulators fail to intervene. Catherine Herridge is live in Washington for us this afternoon. Catherine, uh, HSBC officials are acknowledging now they made mistakes. Well, that's right. What came out at this morning's session is that HSBC executives knew for seven years that its branch operations were playing fast and loose with the rules. Uh, the hearing has just wrapped up after four hours of testimony. During that testimony, one London-based executive said he was resigning and he apologized for the bad practices that exposed the U.S. financial system. I have said before and I will say again, despite the best efforts and intentions of many dedicated professionals, HSBC has fallen short of our own expectations and the expectations of our regulators. As about the status of a criminal case against HSBC, a Justice Department spokeswoman telling Fox she couldn't comment because of an ongoing investigation, Shep. And now we know there are thousands of accounts with no names attached. <laughs> Well, that was one of the stunning admissions today, is that 41% of the HSBC accounts in the Cayman Islands do not have any client information attached to them. 15% don't even have a file. On Iran, email evidence suggesting HSBC affiliates coached banks to avoid financial reporting requirements. Even though the HB, HSBC group was on notice as early as 2001, that HSBC affiliates were sending these hidden Iranian transactions through their accounts in the U.S. Nobody did anything to stop it for years. 
And in the last hour, lawmakers were also told that HSBC maintained an account for the Taliban after 9-11 and an account in 2008 for a known Syrian terrorist connected to the Assad regime. Senator Levin is recommending that HSBC lose its access to U.S. markets. And analysts say that um, if they don't police themselves, rather, analysts say this would be more punitive than any fine or criminal charge against them, Shepard. Mm. Catherine Harrods in Washington. Catherine, thank you. You're welcome. Well, with us now is the Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano, along with the lawyers, whom we'll get to later. Uh, this is a lot, Judge. I, well, well, this, this is egregious. very troubling. I mean, we start with the observation that this is the second largest bank in the world, and it's the largest in Europe. They have assets of close to $3 trillion. Mm. As Catherine indicated, if they are barred from engaging in banking in the United States, that would be a severe, almost catastrophic uh, punishment on them. But think about what they have done. They have violated laws which have serious criminal penalties. If they knowingly and intentionally caused money to go from A to B, and either A or B is, a, is an organized criminal enterprise or a terrorist organization as defined by the Secretary of the Treasury, and they get that list every day, they know who's, who's on the list, then they have participated in a conspiracy to uh, provide material assistance to terrorist organizations. If someone died as a result of that, these bankers are facing a prosecution with a possible death sentence. So you're talking about the tip of an enormous criminal probe, a huge regulatory strike, and the possible barring of this enormous bank from continuing to do business here. Where, where does this go next? And for people who have accounts with HSBC, what are they supposed to do? Well, they won, they're not going to lose their money. I don't know where this goes next. It's very unusual, though, the manner in which we learned about this through Senate investigators. This is so serious, it should have been put in the hands of the Justice Department before this investigation was sprung on HSBC. So I suggest that either the Justice Department knows about it and is ready to seek uh, indictments and uh, to arrest people, or the Senate investigators were a little slow at the switch. You mentioned earlier, if the bank is done, if the, I mean, if, if the bank is dumb as an institution, it'll pay. Yes. But if the bank is playing dumb, we have a problem. We have a very serious problem. If they really didn't know that this was the Taliban, the regulatory consequences will be huge, but they won't lose their liberty. If they knew it was the Taliban or thought it was the Taliban and, noted, uh, and intentionally looked the other way, well, then you have a criminal conspiracy for which the Justice Department is now almost obliged to seek indictments. And that sort of a conspiracy, as you mentioned earlier, would carry with it the potential for a death penalty. If someone died as a result of this, yes. If no one died as a result of it, you're talking about 20 years. We don't, in a federal institution, we don't know how many people were involved. We don't know how broad the conspiracy was. We don't know if it was negligent or if it was intentional. But it involves the second largest bank in the world. Find and, out. and some of the most deadly criminal and terrorist gangs we know of. Quite a mix. Judge, thank you. You're welcome. Back to this bizarre story that we picked up on earlier in the week. Questions today about the case of these needles found in sandwiches. On Delta Airlines flights that originated in Amsterdam, there are criminal investigations underway. And Judge Anna Napolitano here is the look, uh, our Fox News senior judicial analyst, to have a look at this. And good morning to good morning, you. Bill. Criminal investigation means what, based on what we know? Well, it means that the FBI, in, in conjunction with foreign authorities, will look to see who, who had the means and the opportunity to put these needles in the food. I mean, when you, when you eat food, the provider of the food is, is what's called strictly liable, meaning if you're injured, you don't have to demonstrate how the needle got in there. You just have to demonstrate that you bought the food and the food injured uh -huh. you. Uh -huh. So the police want to know how it got there because somebody is either trying to injure strangers or injure the food company or injure the airlines or injure international travel. That's why the FBI is involved. The, the company is Gate Gourmet. Right. Uh, we, we've big, probably all big, eaten their food. Right. That's a big company. Yes. Uh, as it relates to Delta, I think the food is made in Amsterdam. Right. Near the airport there. So it originated there. What's the harm? What is the question of harm when it comes well, to legalities? The, the, here? the harm is the invasion of your body with a foreign object and any medical or physical harm. The harm is also the emotional terror and fear that this happened to you and some unknown ailment could harm you in the future. So you have two causes of action uh, before, a, uh, before a court. The, the other harm is 
big picture here, this could be some attempt to interfere with international transportation. That's why the Federal uh, Bureau of Investigation is involved. The suggestion would be terrorism of some sort. Well, it doesn't or... appear to be terrorism. It appears as though it's some sort of a, a crackpot or a disgruntled uh, employee, either of the airline or of the food company. But because it happened at an international flight, the federal government is quite properly involved. I think about the Tylenol case from the 1980s. Yes. It did. Did you come across that? Well, yes. I mean, the, the Tylenol case was a, was a case in which somebody either was trying to kill innocents or to harm Johnson & Johnson because yeah. people did die. Johnson & Johnson survived. Tylenol uh, is still out there. If this is a mimic, well, then we have a crazy person uh, on our hands, and this person uh, needs to be found. I'll tell you what this wasn't, though. This wasn't an accident. There are too many of these needles. The father-son comparison on two different flights. This was not an accident. How, how bizarre is that? You have a father and son on separate Delta flights flying out of Europe and both bite into a sandwich with a needle inside you know, of it? It's, it's so bizarre, one is tempted to think that perhaps they were targeted, but it would be very, very difficult for the perpetrator of this to target it unless the perpetrator had Confederates on the plane. Mm -hmm because there were hundreds, maybe thousands of sandwiches made. There's no way for the person who put the needle in to know who's going to eat the sandwich. I know you're not an investigator, you're a judge, but I appreciate the expertise, and we'll see what they find Always out Always a on pleasure. This. Are you going to eat a turkey sandwich on your next flight? At the moment, no. <laughs> right. if that's all Same right. here. Right on. Thank you, Judge. Pleasure. All right. Martha After was very next. close inspection. Well, do any of you remember this last week? Can you get me one of those cow jackets like your previous guest was yes, wearing? Yes, every guest gets one. If you get me Everyone. one, I will wear it on this show. I know my producer doesn't want to hear me say Done, that. done. It is done. <laughs> I will hold you that because it's all on digital tape. Well, you know, we kept our end of the bargain. We found one of those cow jackets. And look at this. The judge kept to his end of the bargain. <laughs> You look just marvelous. I find it a very thinning. Uh, not that you need that. My special thanks to my buddy Scott Gelady for making this fashion statement happen. These are the kind of jackets they wear on, 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 the, on the floor of the Chicago Board of Trade. You trade commodities, you stand out and all of that. And, of course, he trades beef and all that stuff, hence the, the look of that. Do, do not make a bet on Cavuto's show on live television. I well, I admire you. I admire you for doing it. And, and, you know, since you are black and white on issues of the law, I think it's all the better. Very well, clever. Could I ask you this? Uh, first of all, you did this, and I admire, I admire that. But... Um, <laughs> Is there a, a sense of desperation you're getting on legal issues the administration is trying? This Ohio thing, this push, you know, you can come and vote three days ahead of time. All of a sudden, the Obama administration is saying, wait, 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 wait. That, that starts infringing on people if you, you know, you take that All away. Right. Ohio, what, what do you make of this? Well, what I make of it, to come to the end of your answer, is a, a very uh, absurd willingness to file lawsuits in frivolous cases, sort of the Chicago school. Uh, you cross my line, I'm going to sue you no matter what. What we're talking about is the state of Ohio, which recently changed the hours for the time for voting. If you're going to be out of the state on election day, you get to vote up to the night before. If you're going to be out of the country on election day, you get to vote up, on, up to the night before. If you're going to be out of the state, you have to vote on by Friday. All right, so it's a three day difference. The Obama administration filed a lawsuit yesterday. And but how many district people court could this, challenging that? Could this impact? It will impact very few people, but the point of it is they are willing to tie up Republican governments, Republican governors, using state funds for frivolous lawsuits leading up to the campaign. This is the tip of the iceberg, Neil. I think you're going to see one for each state in which the op apparatus of the state is run by Republicans. You're going to see the DNC filing the lawsuit. All right, so just like they've gone after Arizona on the whole illegal immigration issue and everything else, they, there does seem to be a pattern of behavior. Well, their argument here is that they have to educate people about when they can vote. Educate them? You vote on Election Day. And it's going to cost them too much money to provide this education to uh, the Democrats in Ohio who don't know when and where to vote. And by having different rules for different people... Well, wouldn't it be ironic if their push is, is uh, it's the Republican voters who are affected? You know, let's say they're traveling, and now all of a sudden they can't take advantage of this. There was just lightning and thunder, as, we, as I mentioned. That's because I wore this. So you don't think that this amounts to anything or what? Not the judge. No, I don't think the lawsuit amounts to anything. Okay. But I think it reveals a mentality willing to sue over almost everything gotcha. between now and November. I just can't take you seriously. As when Stuart would, Varney would say, it's good news for the lawyers.
But it's not good news for the, for the voters because it's a waste of taxpayers' money and it may delay the outcome of the election if they click on one of these things. Perhaps this would have had greater impact if you weren't wearing the jacket. Perhaps it would have, it would have greater impact if Mr. Varney were wearing the jacket. On his head. <laughs> all right. uh, judge, thank you very, very much. Pleasure. Now, can you, I keep this after all this humiliation? Go, yeah, go ahead. We've expensed it and uh, <laughs> we're charging it to Varney. Well, in his first TV interview since the shooting, George Zimmerman, the man charged with the murder of 17 year old Trayvon Martin, speaking out. But did Zimmerman's own words help or hurt his case? Listen to this. You said to, on, the, on the 911 call that he's running. You said that to the, the dispatch. Maybe I said running, but he was more. You said he's running. Yes. Uh, it was like skipping, going away quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but he wasn't running out of fear. You could tell the difference? He wasn't running. He wasn't so he wasn't actually running? No, sir. Okay, because that's what you said to the dispatcher. You thought he was running. Joining us right now is Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Good morning to you, Judge. Good morning, guys. What'd you think of that? Well, I thought that Sean asked some superb questions, and I thought it's a great get, a great interview. But if I were his lawyer, I would not have let him give the interview. You know, one of the advantages that the defendant has is the government has to go first. He doesn't have to say anything. Mm -hmm. The government doesn't hear his voice. The government doesn't get to interrogate him, if ever, until after his uh, case is in. And then he decide whether or not, decides whether or not he wants to take the witness stand. Mm -hmm. George Martin sort of took the witness stand yesterday, and uh, Sean Hannity cross-examined. Uh, George Zimmerman, excuse me, took the witness stand, and Sean Hannity cross-examined him. Mm -hmm. And that issue, the clip that you just pa played, was Trayvon Martin running, walking quickly, or skipping. Now provides a field day for the prosecutors to explore in their case. In just that one little piece of information. I mean, he also said in this interview that he, I'm paraphrasing here, but that he thought it was God's plan that this all potentially happened. And then he said he had no regrets. I mean, if you're, if you're the prosecution, it, are you basing your entire case around those two statements? Well, you're not basing your entire case on those two statements, but, but these are statements that the jury will hear because they are sort of admissions. They're statements that he made uh, in an effort to, uh, to justify himself. Peter, I don't know why lawyers let, uh, let their clients do this. Well, there were a lot of things said during this interview, and there was one issue with regard to a racial epithet that's very interesting. Let's watch that, and you tell us what you think then, Judge. It was a controversy from early on, George, where there were some in the media that, quote, hired expert voice analysts and on certain networks, and then they ended up having to recant and rescind their analysis, where they said these, quote, expletives get away with this all the time. Um, do you remember what it was that you said specifically on the tape? Punks. Punks. P -U it was not a racial epithet of no. any type. A type. No, and I can tell you that when the police played it for me in the station, it was clear as day. When he says punks, I believe out of nervousness, but I don't know him, he smiles. Yeah. What is that? Well, I, I think, I, mean, I don't know what's in his head. I think he smiles because that word punks was translated by another network as blacks which would show a racial animus on his part. So he was now, there's showing saying, wrong, yeah. There's nothing wrong with being against punks. Right, Pe sure. people, people that are inappropriately uh, behaving right. uh, in, a, in a public uh, place. But to have an animus yeah, against somebody because of their skin color changes the dynamics of this uh, sure. prosecution. I don't think he helped himself. Uh, with that interview uh, at all. And I thought Sean's questions were probing and excellent. Yeah, it was a great interview. It was terrific. But, Judge, you know, if the prosecution were to introduce portions of the tape into the trial, he wasn't under oath to, to, that his answers were going to be truthful. No, but if the prosecution introduces portions of those tapes in trial, that will virtually force him to take the stand. Sure. And once exactly. he takes the stand, they now have areas of, of his thought to interrogate him about that they didn't know about before this. And uh, that tape. were different than what he said in the police statement. Precisely. Yes, and so. jurors sometimes question the credibility of a witness when they give several different versions of very, very important events. All right, Judge. Thanks, Thank Judge. you very much for Pleasure, the analysis. Guys.